meeting for the fall semester of the series Language Matters. We try to bring together faculty, staff, students who are working in language and culture instruction to exchange best practices, best ideas, and hopefully keep, uh, keep the conversation going. Very, very quickly, because I want to get us right into the talk you have in on your chair, this pink slip that has some of the coming events we have uh, for the semester. It's by far not, a, not completely full and inclusive yet, so do check our website for updates and other things that are coming up in the coming weeks and so forth. Uh, let me get into a very short introduction of our speaker. This semester we decided, we made the decision actually last semester that fall, and hopefully we'll even move into spring, we wanted to dedicate to having our incredible, our extraordinary graduate student assistant instructors be the focus of our presentations. We found increasingly that the ideas and practices they're bringing to our classrooms are the kinds of things that the old folk like myself need both to hear and to experience firsthand. So I have the pleasure of having today's speaker in my own seminar last semester and thought the work she was doing was simply astonishingly impressive and I thought we really all should share it. So with no further ado, let me introduce our speaker today. Is Sarah Lepichon, who is a PhD student in French studies in our Department of French and Italian, working on non-conforming individuals and identity negotiations in the 19th century. She works with Voices Against Violence, developing, lead, developing and leading trauma-informed teaching workshops for both faculty and staff. She also creates inclusivity workshops for various groups on campus. Most recently, she was invited to speak at the Faculty Innovation Center's Inclusive Teaching and Learning Symposium. You'll notice again on the pink sheet, one of their, more, their next workshops, in fact, later this week, is going to be one more in this series um, that Sarah was a presenter in. Uh, and she's also been asked to present on inclusive learning for, and environments at the English department's orientation. Uh, her line now, not mine. She does not claim to be an expert on any of these topics or anything else except maybe the Harry Potter series. I beg to differ because I find very much she is a specialist, certainly on today's topic, inclusive pedagogy and the language learning classroom. Please welcome uh, our assistant instructor, Sarah Le Pichon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Garza, for the introduction. And we're happy to be today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so like Dr. Garza said, I am the graduate student in French studies, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, and I've been working with Voices Against Violence, which for those of you who don't know, uh, is a really amazing organization on campus that works with um, individuals who have um, survived interpersonal violence, sexual assault, other forms of violence. Um, and I've been developing inclusive pedagogical frameworks with them for a while now, um, particularly a series on trauma-informed teaching. Um, and I've developed some series on difficult dialogues, specifically targeted towards TAs and AIs. But I do want to reiterate, I'm sorry, Dr. Garza, um, that I, I don't think this makes me an expert. I'm still learning and I'm still discovering new practices and learning how to make old practices better, and I really want this to be a conversation more than anything else. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to be um, presenting on various practices that you might implement into your classrooms, that we might implement into our classrooms, to help make them more inclusive spaces. And I'm going to focus on three primary topics, um, the first one being welcoming trans and gender non-conforming individuals into our language classrooms. Uh, the other one being about representation and race and ethnicity. And the last one being about um, diversifying our materials um, and providing additional resources, which this last one is a very broad topic and is kind of going to overlap with the first two. Um, and I just want to say that these are three topics of hundreds that need addressing in regards to inclusivity in the language classroom, in any classroom. Um, the Faculty Innovation Center is doing amazing work. Um, they do amazing presentations on universal design for learning that I'm really obsessed with that um, present the idea that there is no such thing as a standard learner and that we should adapt our classrooms to that, and it's really amazing. But universal design for learning is so fascinating, but I won't be talking about it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to really just present just a few, three or four for each topic 
um, kind of hopefully practically implementable practices. Um, and my examples and my resources are drawn directly from my time as a French instructor. Um, so I hope that that can be carried out into other languages. I'm sure it can be carried out into other languages. Um, but my examples will be in, from my time as a French instructor. Um, and I really just want to get us all thinking about inclusivity and how we can open up our classrooms to more students and more populations. Um, and I do want to say, I have a little reminder on the handout, but I do want to say that not everyone is necessarily going to feel comfortable with all of these practices. Um, so depending on where you are in your career, whether you're a graduate student or a professor or whatever it is, um, you can choose whatever practices you feel most comfortable with. This is not a how-to. This is just, these are some suggestions that I've found to be successful in my experience. So the first thing I'm going to be talking about is welcoming trans and gender non-conforming students into our classrooms, which I think is, of course, most important for those of us who work in heavily gendered languages, like all of the Romance languages. It's certainly the case with French. Um, I am always, within the first week or two, asked by my students what the gender neutral pronouns in French are. Um, and students will ask this, and if we don't have an answer, I think that our gender non-conforming students um, are going to feel further marginalized. So if nothing else, we want to be able to have an answer to that. Um, and my practice now is um, to ask them their pronouns before I'm asked that question. Um, so that's part of it. Um, I think asking in general is one of the things that I recommend the most. Um, I mean, we should all be asking for pronouns anyway. We can't tell a person's gender by looking at them. Um, so we can't, we also can't assume that within the classroom, any individual is ready or wants to share their gender identity with the class, um, which means that teachers and instructors should be trained on how to have these conversations with their students. So the first practice that I recommend in the classroom and that I've been doing for a while now that I've felt has been very successful is coming to class on the first day with note cards. Hopefully all of these practices are small and implementable. So coming to class on the first day with note cards and on the note card asking your students to write their name as it appears on the registrar so that you can easily identify them on your roster, their preferred name, and their pronoun. Um, from there, and that helps avoid um, for any uh, of our trans students or gender non-conforming students, that helps, um, that avoids them having to, in the moment, come out to the class, make a decision about whether they want to correct you, those kinds of things. Um, the next step, once you have your note cards um, is that if you have any trans or gender non-conforming students, is to have a conversation with them. Um, have a conversation with them outside of the class and ask them what tactic they want you to adopt, what they feel most comfortable with. Would they like for you to correct students in the classroom? Would they like for you to correct students outside of class? Um, how would they like for you to handle those situations? This should really um, be a conversation with the individual themselves and what their preferences are and what makes them feel most comfortable. Um, you might also, to the best of your ability, open up options. Um, I know in language classrooms, we love to shuffle up partners and ask them to have different partners every day, which um, in terms of language practice makes so much sense in terms of practicing different accents, practicing with different um, speaking abilities, etc. Um, but you might offer um, trans or gender non-conforming students to stick with one partner that they're comfortable with to avoid unnecessary misgendering, and things like that. So to just, if you can open up options for those students in any way you can to make them feel more comfortable. Um, and then a very basic one um, as well is just knowing your information, knowing your gender neutral pronoun information. 
um, and um, presenting it to your students as um, important materials. So even if it feels complicated as you're familiarizing yourself with these pronouns, um, telling your students in class when you're asked about gender neutral pronouns, telling your students, well, it's really complicated, I really don't know where to start, is going to be very discouraging. Um, so you want to, to the best of your ability, have something that um, have the answers yourself, have answers to what are the gender neutral pronouns in my language. Um, I like also sending my students this infograph because um, while I don't want to present gender pronouns as very complicated, the reality of the situation is that grammar is complicated in French. And I like this little infograph because it has the pronoun at the top um, and the direct object pronoun at the bottom. It gives you example sentences of how to use them and it reminds you to always ask, always respect the person's pronouns, um, and to practice using the person's pronouns. Um, I love this infograph. It was created by a nonprofit organization in Canada. Yay, Canada. Um, and um, hopefully this feels accessible to your students. Um, so, providing them with clear and accessible information. Um, I do want to clarify that by saying that we don't want to make gender neutral pronouns seem overly complicated. We do want to be honest about how these conversations are or are not happening in the country that um, speak our languages, right? We don't, um, I mean, in France, for example, um, it is okay and important to have conversations with your students about how this is not a topic, this is not a widespread topic um, that is being talked about in the mainstream. Um, that if, for example, they go on um, the study abroad trip to Lyon, um, this is something that we could talk about, but that, you know, when they meet their families or something, won't be standard practice. Um, but that doesn't mean that these conversations aren't being had. Of course, there are plenty of trans and gender non-conforming individuals in France, and there are so many different resources. Um, so the um, last thing that you can do that I really recommend is to provide them with resources. Um, so I think this is really important, especially if you are not yourself part of the identity group that you're talking about, that you're having a conversation with your students about. Um, so um, there are so many, the internet can be a really horrifying place, but it can also be a really lovely place. And there are some amazing bloggers, there are amazing articles, there are amazing YouTubers um, having great conversations about this all over the internet. Um, and so I like to provide some resources in that way as well. This is an example um, that I like. This is um, an LGBTQ plus YouTuber, um, Prince Princess, who in this video um, Princess is talking about all of the different ways that you can express yourself as a gender non-conforming individual, so all the pronouns that you might use, the options that you have. Et assez fort pour ne plus comparer. Et enfin, Raphaël, que vous demandez d'utiliser des pronoms neutres qui ont été construits au fil du temps, qui ne sont pas forcément hyper répandus dans le grand public, voire pas du tout. Mais voilà, il existe yet. Et nous n'avons pas de pronoms. Um, but Prince Princess is great, and there are so many resources that are really similar to this. Um, let's see, can I do this? I need a talk on technology, on using technology. Can someone help me play this? Push the green button. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay. That was embarrassing. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Um, can I still move That doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so the next thing I'm going to be talking about is representation um, and race and diversity. Um, another question that I inevitably get at the um, within the first week or so of teaching French is um, a student of color who asks me, um, how do I describe myself? Do I call myself noir? Do I call myself black? Um, what words do I use to describe myself? How do I describe myself um, as a black individual? Um, and the answer in France is actually a little complicated. Um, but that's all the more reason for us to be prepared to have these conversations. And these cultural discussions are so important to have in the classroom um, because language is culturally loaded. Um, so the idea here is to really just think about and practice um, methods to have these conversations so that you um, feel as comfortable as possible having them when they come up in your classroom. Um, while at the same time, again, um, as with the other topic, providing authentic resources for your students so that they're hearing from plenty of individuals who are part of this identity group. Um, so the first thing that you can do, that you can hopefully do, not all of us can do this, but if you are lucky enough to be um, working with your own material and creating your own material, the first thing that you can do is diversify your text as much as possible um, and to rethink your material every semester, right? Your material shouldn't be featuring only certain identities um, and um, because things keep moving forward and that's how progress works, this isn't something that we can just do once and decide that now it's done and now my material is diverse and inclusive and I can check it off my list. It's something that we have to kind of come back to every semester and rethink every semester. Um, so you want to just kind of always consistently be asking yourself questions about um, am I representing different identity groups and what does that representation look like in my texts? Um, so to that end, as you're looking through your material, you also want to try and eliminate any exclusionary language that you might have in there, any exclusionary exercises. I do not mean by this that you need to be censoring your texts at all, um, but simply that you're asking yourself questions about the kind of representation that you have, right? Are any of my exercises, is any of my language stereotyping a certain identity group? Um, those kinds of questions. Um, and finally, as with everything else, um, the best practice is always to just kind of have open conversations with your students. Um, for example, about what it means to be black in France, about how we talk about it, or again, how we don't talk about it, because race in France isn't really talked about, um, certainly not the way that it's talked about here in the States. Um, so to, again, be honest with your students about this, what is the language that's being used in France? Um, and um, this is maybe a difficult to practice, but one that hopefully the more we do it, the more comfortable with it we become is to acknowledge our own privilege and acknowledge um, any gaps in knowledge that we might have. Um, acknowledge that our experience is ours alone, especially, again, if we're not part of these identity groups. Um, just acknowledge the privilege that you have. Um, and um, to uh, in trying to kind of open up that conversation, in acknowledging your own privilege, um, you again want to um, provide resources to your students, have them hear as many voices as possible, have them um, familiarize themselves with authentic material, um, how is this conversation being had in all of the countries that my language speaks. Um, so I have another example here that I like to show my students. Um, this is a video series called Fene, um, and it's um, all about being black and being French and the intersections of those two things. And these are just interviews of um, Parisian people. Thank you.
for them than for me actually. For instance, when they talk to us, they can't fully grasp all the subtleties of our culture being black and French. They always tend to refer to French image like croissant, being a white dude with a talking cheese or this type of cliche. But they don't know what it is to be black and French at the same time. Where we know so that's just an example. Again, there are so many resources out there. Um, and which brings me to my last, my last um, concept, which is um, providing resources and working beyond the classroom. And again, I've mm -hmm. talked about this already, and it's going to be overlapping on a lot of the concepts that I mentioned. Um, but one of the first things, again, is to really just know your resources when a student comes to you needing a resource to know which one to send them to and to have specifics on them as well right a student so these are the resources on here i have the resources that i have used multiple times every single semester so those are the counseling and mental health center and pab um, services for students with disabilities behavioral con concerns advice line the ombuds office and student emergency services i have the recommended or myself used for these services every single semester. Um, and um, I also always, so for um, the resources that I provide my students, I also have very short two or three line little blurb of what the resource is, right? What it, what it does for the students um, so that they can easily identify the, their needs. Um, and then I give them a phone number as well. Um, phone number and or an email address. Students are always so much more likely to reach out if they have the specifics on hand than they are to reach out if they have to go and find that information themselves. Um, so providing resources is so important. Um, and also, I think that, to backtrack for just a second, I wanted to make this a separate separate concept because I know that not all of us do create our material and not all of us have um, the ability to um, work with the syllabus, work with the material, but we, that doesn't mean that we don't all have the ability to make our classrooms inclusive spaces. Um, so I think that providing resources and working you know, around the classroom, around the material is so possible. Um, so I wanted to make that clear. Um, so, um, again, I've said this in the past two uh, discussions as well, but letting other voices be heard, um, especially if you're not part of that identity group, um, is really important. Um, and what I like to do also is before class I show, I tend that that's when I tend to show these kinds of materials. Um, or talk about those kinds of materials as the students are kind of coming in and settling down and playing a video or I'm playing a music clip or something like that. And at the end of the week, I like to send them a little newsletter that has all of the information, um, all of the resources that we've looked at that week. So I just send, you know, the title of the artist and the song or I send the link to the article or whatever it is so that it's all there for the students. It's all accessible. Um, and, but it doesn't feel overwhelming, right? It's like an announcement that if they're feeling overwhelmed with French class that week, they can just kind of ignore and be like, okay, I'm gonna concentrate on my indirect object pronouns and not look at the newsletter this week. Um, but it's also all there for students who are looking to practice French more, who are looking for outside resources, um, those kinds of things. Um, and finally, I really encourage everyone to talk to your supervisors. I think this would be if you have a supervisor, I know not yourself as a supervisor, talk to your supervisor about inclusivity and um, additions to tests and those kinds of things. Um, and those are all of my recommended practices. On the handout, um, there is a sheet with the practices sorted into before, during, and after class in some space for you to think about how you um, how you might implement those into your classroom. Um, I like worksheets and working through things. So hopefully that can be of use to someone. But that is all. Do you have anyone has questions?
questions or other suggestions, other things that have worked in their classes, other things that work with other languages. Please. So I, I can take privilege here to start start off because I think actually the Q and A section of these presentations is some of the most useful part we have. Um, I love this stuff, <clears throat> and I've um, <clears throat> only recently found uh, my own textbook getting a 6 out of 10 rating. I was crushed because of 6 out of 10 rating for inclusivity, this Russian language textbook, largely because finding materials, Russia is not inclusive, let's just say it as it is, Mr. Putin, not so much, Russia itself, not so much. Um, to get authentic materials that are themselves, especially with gender issues, inclusive, ethnic, one thing, gender, completely different one, very difficult to do. And so as a result, we wound up with a textbook that we felt was representative of Russia in 2010, but for world global standards of what is inclusive and inclusive, inclusive in our own classrooms here, not at all, really not very, very good at it. What, can we do when getting authentic materials and I'm thinking of countries I've been working with Arabic uh, the last three years getting materials that are inclusive in Arabic speaking countries also challenging to do how do we create in a sense environments where getting these materials is not the problem or not the, the not, we don't have the ease with which we'd like it to be to make it part of our classes every day any suggestions you've got on on how we can, in a sense, make our classrooms still represent their cultures, mm -hmm. but also be the kind of ideal inclusive environment that you're talking about here, which is incredibly laudable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely in terms of the classroom, in terms of the textbook, textbook itself, um, I'm not sure how many suggestions I have, but in terms of the classroom, I think that there's always the possibility of having that conversation and that open discussion with your students. Right. Um, and I would honestly maybe just start there. Um, and that doing small things also like the note cards signals to your students that yeah. those identities, while they may not be recognized, while they may not be um, kind of standard practice in those countries, you recognize these identities in your classroom and they're valid in your classroom. Mm -hmm. So kind of establishing that kind of base um, inclusive environment from the beginning um, that signals also to your students that if they need to or want to have a conversation with you about these things that they can okay. um, and then you yourself having those conversations um, with certain exercises you know if there's an exercise that maybe particularly lends itself to it mm -hmm. thank you please go wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Because I face the same problem you do. Hindi, the language is not inclusive. The country was not inclusive. Now we're at a mm -hmm. crossroad. Legally we are, but still culturally it's not a very inclusive um, culture right. uh, at this point in time. Um, I use that to my advantage. Because you can use the materials you have and then take that as a board to start discussing what is happening in the culture, yeah. whether it's inclusive or not, and get them to debate the whole issue. And you can even start that at the elementary level. Uh, we don't have a gender neutral pronoun yet. So we talk about how we don't have it, and hopefully that will change, the language will change to keep up with the legal changes. That mm -hmm. So small little pieces so people in there know that we are in an inclusive space, and they're discussing how to get uh, the language. That's quite nice. That's quite nice. That's one way of dealing with yeah. it because we have exactly the same time. And I would add also um, to when that's the case to let your students um, use their imagination and let them, right. um, you know, right. if, if, if a student, if you have this conversation with a student, um, offer for your student to come up with their own gender neutral pronoun in the language. You know, if they tell you, I'm not, I'm really not comfortable deciding on a single pronoun, I would like to use this pronoun, have the conversation about, great, grammatically, um, mm -hmm. here's what you can do, um, I'll take this into uh, consideration when I'm grading all of your paragraphs, etc. Yeah, I was just going to say, in addition to those comments, it's a great way to do what Apple wants us to do, which is compare cultures. Mm -hmm. and, and not say all cultures are 
doing the same things, um, operating on the same uh, level, the same moments, but really to heighten their awareness. Because um, very often we've been the retrograde culture in a lot of regards, so um, it's, uh, it's a really wonderful way to add the cultural component, I think, to, to what language is and talk about the cultural impact. Mm -hmm. Let them think about that, too. It's a great idea. Carl, you have to get. Yeah, first of all, thanks so much for this. It's really fascinating, and I think that um, the, the categories that you're talking about here, so race and gender, and ableness, and all the categories that are kind of indexed now by the new categories of, of this inclusive, the labeled inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, there have always been a lot of social categories, but these are the hot ones mm -hmm. that are being the hot button ones now. And what are, so what's so interesting about all of them is that they're all so dynamic. People are making it up as they go along. And this is so great to get into discussions about uh, how language changes mm -hmm. and how students are always coming into your class thinking that uh, the vocabulary in the back is what I have to memorize. So there's this, you know, language has to fixate a, a form with a meaning. And that's what we learn. And so this is getting them less than that language is so much more dynamic. Right? And, it, and you get to negotiate with them. You know, it does what sort of negotiation means. So this is a really great lesson that goes beyond just the particulars of, of how to racial identity. But it's really, I think, an important lesson to teach them about this is how languages continue to, to evolve. So that's the, the, the one thing I want to say. And there's a, I, I was thinking in the talk, in sociolinguistics, there is this People talk about authenticity all the time. You have it here on authentic text. Mm -hmm. And authentic text typically uh, in the literature means that it, um, how should I put it? it reflects a kind of native likeness so that people who speak authentic French sound like they're from Paris, that kind of thing. Um, but there's also a, 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 a way of talking about it that it, authenticity is what's authentic to me, what mm -hmm. feels right for me. And those two things are really in opposition. Mm -hmm. And so there's this new movement, kind of this, it, instead of talking about a multilingualism, there's this notion of translingualism. Mm -hmm. So I'm moving back and forth between different kinds of settled norms, but I'm trying to figure out what fits for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so trans has become a new prefix for all of this too. Mm -hmm. It's like this movement book between all these things. Yeah. And I think all of these notions are basically fundamental to understanding what language is, but this really makes it kind of understandable in a way. Because mm -hmm. they're, they're used to talking about this right now. It's right <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the discourse today, so it's yeah. terrific. Yeah. Thank you. I also like um, taking it as an opportunity and thinking about um, how language evolves uh, in, in my French class. Yeah. I always like taking it as an opportunity to talk about l'Académie Française and what their French is as opposed to